Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Implement Disaster Recovery in a Hybrid Cloud World with AWS and Pure Storage. This event is brought to you by Pure Storage and AWS and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media and I'm excited to be your moderator for today's event. Now we want this webinar to be an educational webinar for you out there in the audience. So we encourage you to use the questions box in your audience console. It's just to the left of the slides window where it says handouts and then right next to that it says questions. So we encourage your questions throughout the event and we'll be doing a dedicated Q&A session with the best questions from the audience at the end of the presentation. We also have a number of handouts available for you there in your audience console, so check out the handouts tab. And finally, we'll be announcing the winner of an Amazon $300 gift card on the live presentation. If you're watching this on demand, I'm sorry, the drawing has already occurred. The prize terms and conditions can be found in the handouts tab where it says ATM prize terms. And with that, I'm excited to hand it over to our presenters from Pure Storage. Take it away. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time and spending uh, some time with us today learning about disaster recovery and hybrid cloud with AWS and Pure. We have, uh, you know, I'm joined by uh, uh, two more speakers. So my name is Kunal Kapoor. I'm Director of Product Management here at Pure, responsible for the cloud products and services we are building. I'm joined by Henry Axelrod. Uh, who is a solution architect in the AWS team. And Henry is someone we work very closely with as we build this product and we continue to evolve the Cloud Blockstore product. Very excited to have Wes. Uh, Wes is one of our key partner, uh, key customers uh, who's uh, been very successful with Cloud Blockstore as a product, especially when it comes to disaster recovery, which is the topic at hand. Um, so Pure, uh, as a company, uh, you know we've been very successful on-prem. Uh, we have about $1.64 billion in revenue, annual revenue, and we've been growing at a very steady clip quarter over quarter, year after year. We are at about 7,500 plus customers who've deployed our appliances on-prem, be it Flash Blade and Flash Array appliances, are all Flash appliances. And again, you know, from a customer experience perspective, our net promoter score, which is at 82%, speaks volumes about how our customers have really appreciated the simplicity of the products we've built. We have always been in the top half of the Gardner Magic Quadrant, uh, which talks of volumes about the techni technical, um, you know, the technical aptitude of our products, but more importantly, also talks about the innovation that we've been able to bring to our customers year over year uh, with all of the evolutions we've had across our product line. So um, we've, had, we've had a lot of success with our customers building out their private clouds uh, on Pure's uh, all Flash appliances that I talked about with Flash Array and Flash Blade. As you can see, we have several private clouds that our customers have been able to build on their, in their data centers, be it some of the logos that you see. And the reason that our customers have been so successful in building out their private and hosted clouds on our appliances is really comes down to two big, um, you know, features or underpinnings of our product. The first one being how effortless and simple our products are to use on-prem. Three simple commands to get started with a flash array on-prem. Um, you know, not these massive amount of manuals or uh, user guides that you know, most of our competitive products have. Very, very simple to get started with a flash array and with a flash plate appliances. And the second piece being the evergreen storage. What we mean by evergreen storage is that when you have a flash array or a flash blade in your appliance in your data center, you're, you're, you're always guaranteed that you can upgrade anything in the stack in a non-disruptive manner. So you don't have to go through any kind of heavy, any kind of forklift upgrades or any kind of migrations. All of it is kind of built into our architecture that you can upgrade anything in the stack non-disruptively without any kind of business or application disruption. Now, what does that mean for our customers? It means that they always have their the pulse on innovation. They have new hardware models or new um, controller models that they can be that can be deployed in the appliances without having to have any kind of downtime. We wanted to take that same kind of experience into the cloud. We wanted to make sure that our customers want to have the same storage experience and the same evergreen and simplicity experience they have on-prem in the cloud. But when we started to look at what our customers today that are on-prem are look what they're trying to do in the cloud what we found is that 
there's a little bit of a cloud divide here when they're trying to take some of their on-prem applications to the cloud. We've been very successful with our customers deploying VMware environments, VM farms, SAP, Oracle, SQL, on-prem, on a flash array. But what we found is that uh, the kind of applications that are getting deployed in the cloud are more web scale like application containers. And the reason we believe that there's a disparity in the kind of applications that are getting deployed on-prem versus the cloud really talks to the different storage experience that they have between on-prem and the cloud and the management and consumption experience. So today on-prem, uh, you get you know, dedicated storage appliances with high availability, resiliency and availability and great performance with storage efficiencies, advanced data services. In the cloud, you have simple scalable storage with shared storage services across object file and block. But again, it's just missing a lot of the features or capabilities that our customers have come to expect on-prem. And then when you look at even the management and consumption experience, very different from on-prem to the cloud. On-prem, uh, you have dedicated hardware, very CapEx manual management kind of model. Everything in the cloud is API driven on-demand consumption model. So what we wanted to challenge ourselves within Pure was can we build this, this common shared data services layer across on-prem and the cloud that really allows our customers to deploy the same applications that they've been deploying on-prem, now they can deploy them in the cloud. Basically, they can develop their applications anywhere and deploy them anywhere where their needs and biz, uh, business takes them. So we wanted to build this common shared data services layer that allows our customers to move from on-prem to the cloud or even bring it back from cloud back on-prem um, but not having to compromise on any capabilities when they're doing that. So the way we could, we knew that we had to accomplish that it was with a very consistent API model that underpins all of that. So the orchestration has to be as seamless as possible if we have to do that. So we are very proud you know, to have announced Cloud Block Store for AWS. Uh, this was a product that we introduced uh, late last year. Uh, so our first uh, you know, product in the cloud and the way we've designed Cloud Block Store is keeping that hybrid mindset in, uh, you know, in the kind of the centerpiece of everything we are doing. We've taken our uh, software, the Purity software that runs on the Flash Array, and we've ported that now to run on the AWS platform. And we've used a combination of different AWS resources to really give our customers the tier one block experience that they've come to expect with us on-prem. Now we can deliver that in the cloud. So giving them the same storage efficiencies and the same kind of advanced uh, service, data services in the cloud. So we announced, uh, so we announced our cloud vision uh, last year and we talked about like three pillars that our cloud vision was kind of predicated on. One was a build your cloud, which allowed our customers to build out their private clouds and hosted clouds on a flash array, flash plate appliance that I talked about earlier. Run anywhere, which is what the focus of this conversation on, which is Cloud Block Store, allowing our customers to run their applications anywhere, be it on-prem, be it in the cloud, without having any kind of compromise. So that was that's our kind of second pillar uh, that uh, underpins our overall cloud vision. And the last one is the protect everywhere. We are looking to modernize our data protection strategy by introducing flash to flash to cloud. But again, the focus of our discussion today is run anywhere, allowing customers to really get that flexibility of on-prem, extending their on-prem into the cloud with the same capabilities that they've come to expect on-prem in the cloud. So Cloud Block Store is the product that we've introduced, uh, which is basically runs on the AWS platform, allowing our customers the same kind of software capabilities that they have with the Purity software that runs on the Flash Array appliance. Now that is running on the cloud platform in AWS. And again, it gives customers the hybrid mobility and protection options that they can have the same experience of on-prem in the cloud now, be it either in their own data centers, be it in hosted environments, or be it in the cloud platform itself. So uh, Cloud Block Store for AWS uh, gets deployed as a 100% software appliance. It gets deployed in the customer's VPC in their account. So it's something that the customer deploys and manages, uh, very similar to how our customers manage a flash array in their data centers. It uh, brings all of the capabilities uh, that our customers have with the Purity software that runs on the flash array appliance. They have that with Cloud Block Store. So they have all of the storage efficiencies around thin provisioning, dedupe and compression. So just allowing our customers to use cloud storage and their cloud footprint in a much more optimal way. It's hybrid in nature. 
What I mean by that is it brings all of the advanced data services always on encryption, quality of service, all of the features that are very important to our customers on-prem with the flash array appliance purity software, all of that is available with Cloud Block Store. It comes with a consistent API model. So um, any automation work that you've done on-prem with a flash array is works as is with Cloud Block Store. You don't have to do any kind of rewrites. All of that is available as is that you can leverage with Cloud Block Store. Uh, it's very flexible from a consumption perspective too. Uh, it's a capacity term-based consumption model of how you consume Cloud Block Store. Again, very cloud-like and very flexible in how you consume that. And I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the uh, end of the session, where how you can procure and how you can consume Cloud Block Store as a product. One other product that I did want to talk about, which kind of, the reason I wanted to mention this product was uh, because it does talk, when I talk about the use cases, this kind of plays very heavily into the use cases. This was a product, CloudSnap, that we introduced. Um, this was some, we introduced about a year ago, which allows our customers uh, to offload their snapshots from a flash array to NFS targets or to AWS S3. And why this is really cool from a product perspective is it's all built into the flash array. This capability is all built into the flash array, allowing our customers to just set up a regular snapshot schedule. And instead of the snapshots living only locally, you can also have the snapshots living on NFS targets or in AWS S3 buckets, all again offloaded by the flash array itself. Now, why that is important is that uh, the way these snapshots are offloaded, they have, they are, they're called self-describing snapshots. They have data and metadata embedded in them that allows them to be recovered to any flash array in your environment. Not only the one that got it offloaded from, but any. Cloud Block Store is just the same purity software that is running on AWS software. So you can absolutely recover any of your cloud snaps that are sitting in AWS S3 into cloud block store. And that really, again, plays to some of the use cases that I'm gonna talk about next. Because if you look at the use cases that our customers are leveraging cloud block store for, it really kind of, there are four big use case buckets that our customers have really, um, you know, really kind of gotten the advantage of cloud block store. The first one is uh, disaster recovery. So this is which you know this is customers who have a flash array on prem and are looking to now use cloud as a dr target they can absolutely just replicate their data from an on prem flash array to cloud block store using our async replication technology same software running on both sides so if there is a dr event they can absolutely fail their applications over uh, to the cloud running on cbs without any compromise so that's probably the number one use case and which is our obviously our topic of discussion today that most customers have really kind of uh, seen the benefit of using Cloud Block Store in their current hybrid environment. The second one is migration. Now, once you have your data sitting in Cloud Block Store, you can absolutely migrate some of the applications to the cloud if there is a need to do that. If there is an application or a business need to migrate that application, you can absolutely do that without having to have, again, any compromise on capabilities. Finally, the last one is dev test. Uh, this is where um, you know customers who are setting up massive dev test environments in the cloud, they can really leverage from the uh, efficiencies of our space efficient snapshots to build out this use case. So test and dev is really predicated on having a lot of snapshots and clones. The way we do our snapshots and clones are very space efficient and very performant. So allows our customers to spin up many different environments or many multiple environments of their production instance in the cloud, having the ability to really kind of uh, iterate over these uh, test and dev instances to do a lot of analytical work. And they can do that with Cloud Block Store in a very cost-effective performant way. You can do all of these use cases that I talked about, DR, migration, and dev test with a combination of Cloud Snap and Cloud Block Store. You can have always your snapshots offloaded to Cloud Snap to begin with in AWS S3. And you can then uh, always hydrate that on demand uh, from those Cloud Snaps into Cloud Block Store. So that just gives our customers another cost effective way of addressing any of those use cases if they want to. So they can always use async replication to move their data directly from a flash array to Cloud Block Store, or they can go the route of offloading snapshots to, to through Cloud Snap to AWS S3 and hydrate that data on demand. So again, just giving customers the flexibility of addressing the same use cases in a few different ways. 
Finally, the last use case was is HA. Uh, when we talk about HA, this is customers who want to deploy two cloud block store instances in two separate availability zones are connected over our active cluster technology. Now, why would customers do that? So if you have a mission critical application that is running in the cloud and it cannot survive even an availability zone outage or a one CBS instance failure uh, outage, you can have a clustered application running across two availability zones within a region that gives you the ability to survive an AZ outage or a CBS instance outage. So for example, if a AZ goes out, the application, the clustered application just seamlessly fails over to the other AZ and just continues running without even missing a heartbeat. So this just allows customers to run in a very highly available cross AZ uh, like deployment. Again, just from a flexibility standpoint, allowing them to address all of the different use cases that they may have in the cloud. Obviously the, you know, the topic of discussion here for this session that we have for you guys is really focused on disaster recovery. So I wanted to kind of double click a little bit on that and then Henry and Wes will go into a lot more details on how to make this use case much more effective and usable in a customer environment. But kind of at least as an introduction, what the DR use case with Cloud Block Store is, is you have your flash array on-prem and you can re async replicate your data from a flash array to Cloud Block Store so simple enough, think about your cloud as your, sec your secondary data center that you're replicating your data into, fairly simple. If you do have a DR event, you can always just spin up your applications in AWS itself. So think about if you're running SQL Server on-prem, uh, you have a DR event, you can always just fail over to the AWS platform and you can just continue running SQL Server on CBS now. So again, just very seamless in nature. You can always bring that data back. So if you're, if there is a need, you know, after the DR event is done and you still need to run your application on-prem, you can always bring that data back from the cloud back to on-prem. Async replication technology that you can leverage for that is um, very efficient, uh, very performant. We send all of the data compressed over the wire. So we use the network bandwidth very optimally. And obviously it gives you the performance of storage replication to allow you to really get the best of both worlds. With that, I wanted to uh, pass it on to Henry uh, to talk a lot about how did we build Cloud Block Store re leveraging really the power of the AWS platform that we had uh, at our disposal and which we really allowed us to build a differentiated product. Henry, on to you. Thanks, Kunal. Uh, so today I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the AWS platform. So uh, to start off with, and since we're just talking about disaster recovery today, I uh, wanted to just uh, go over a little bit about, uh, about how AWS global infrastructure looks. So AWS deploys uh, data centers all around the world to be where our customers need them. We, we put these data centers uh, uh, cluster these data centers together in geographical locations, which we call regions. And within that re these regions, we have multiple availability zones that are separated by meaningful distance to allow customers, as Kanal was mentioning, to build highly available architectures that meet their needs, whether that's uh, between multiple availability zones in a particular geographical region or even across different uh, geographical regions. AWS currently has uh, 24 regions all around the world, uh, as you can see here, and we continue to expand that with uh, three additional regions announced and nine of the additional availability zones. So when customers think about the uh, the AWS global infrastructure, we see uh, commonalities and some of the uh, the benefits that they're seeing. Things like uh, security, as uh, Kanal was mentioning earlier, uh, security is is hugely important to our customers, and AWS provides a range of security services uh, and features that allow customers to uh, keep their data. Uh, uh, secure and encrypted throughout uh, any of our service platforms. Also, when you think of disaster recovery, availability is hugely important to be able to have your data and your services be available when you need them and where you need them. And AWS provides a platform that 
uh, allows you to have the availability of resources uh, to, with, to meet the agility of your business. Uh, also, um, it's important to be able to uh, provide the right performance and provide that at scale. Uh, in a DR event, you may go from having you know, virtually uh, no infrastructure uh, running on uh, on the cloud to having to spin up a large amount of infrastructure to uh, be able to uh, process your workloads. So being able to scale up or scale down as needed uh, is hugely important for a successful uh, disaster recovery implementation. So AWS ultimately gives you that uh, that flexibility to be able to uh, just to scale as you need and and only uh, pay for services that you're, you're utilizing. Another important uh, capability, uh, Kanal was talking a lot about uh, the uh, storage layer with Cloud Block Store, but uh, equally important, uh, as you mentioned for during the DR use case, is the ability to, uh, to spin up uh, different uh, compute for those workloads that you have uh, with um, uh, running against Pure Cloud Block Store. So uh, AWS uh, has a service called uh, Amazon Elastic uh, Compute Cloud, or otherwise known as Amazon EC2. And we provide you a wide variety of uh, different types of uh, EC2 instances uh, for, uh, from general purpose instances to instances that are specialized by resources like memory, storage, uh, even instances that have, uh, have GPU uh, capabilities, along with a wide variety of different capabilities and options. That all in all gives you more than 200 different instance types that let you run virtually every type of workload your business may need. AWS also offers a, a wide variety of storage services, uh, several of which uh, are the, become the building blocks for, uh, for Cloud Block Store. Uh, we offer services across file, block, and object, uh, including services like, um, uh, like Amazon Simple Storage Service or Amazon S3, uh, which is our object storage service, as well as a wide variety of uh, connectivity and data transfer options like AWS Direct Connect that allows you to have a dedicated bandwidth between your data center and uh, an AWS region or your colo facility. And this can be you know, hugely important for disaster recovery solutions uh, in case you need to ensure that uh, customers who might be still connecting through those locations are able to get to your, uh, your infrastructure running on AWS. Or uh, you know, if you need higher bandwidth to be able to replicate your data. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, uh, security is uh, is hugely important, and along with uh, security, uh, also goes compliance. And uh, AWS uh, works with a number of security and compliance uh, controls and certifications. Customers on the AWS platform are able to uh, uh, inherit. Uh, some of these compliances like ISO 9001 or 2717 uh, or 2718 for cloud privacy and cloud security. Customers uh, get SOC 1, SOC 2, SOC 3. Customers can be PCI and HIPAA compliant on the AWS platform, as well as uh, compliant with uh, regulations like uh, GDPR or for our uh, our federal uh, customers can be uh, compliant with uh, with FedRAMP requirements all the way through uh, through FedRAMP High, and as well as ITAR compliance. So I just wanted to now take a, a moment to look at uh, Pure's architecture. As I mentioned, um, the architecture is based and runs on top of some of the uh, uh, AWS uh, service offerings like uh, EC2, DynamoDB, and Amazon S3. Uh, so as you can see here, this is what the general configuration looks like for Cloud Block Store, which is similar to uh, 
what it looks like uh, on an on-premises where you have a set of controllers and a set of data nodes that are based on our uh, i3 platform using uh, localized high-speed localized uh, SSD instance storage and able to use uh, both Amazon S3 and DynamoDB for durability layers. As Kanal mentioned, uh, the Pure Cloud Block Store is also able to take advantage of the multiple availability zones that AWS provides through their active cluster technology. For, so for those customers who need to ensure availability, uh, even across uh, different availability zones as part of their uh, business requirements, uh, you can have the, uh, a pure cloud block store cluster in one availability zone and in another availability zone and have those be made available through the active cluster technology that pure provides. And finally, um, the same replication technology that pure provides for replicating from on-premises to AWS can also be used in a scenario where you want to replicate uh, between different regions within AWS. So if your primary workload is running in AWS and you want to, for instance, have a disaster recovery workload uh, running in AWS as well, uh, you can see that in this scenario, I have a primary workload that might be running in US East 1, and I want to make sure I have a disaster recovery workload prepared in US West 1 if in case I need to, um, to fail over at any point. So Pure Cloud Block Store enables that by using the same replication technology built into Purity that allows you to replicate uh, from on-prem to AWS, also allows you to replicate between AWS regions. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Wes, who's going to tell you a little bit more about Cornerstone's use case. Thanks, Henry. Hi, my name is Wes North. I am the AVP of Technology Operations at Cornerstone On Demand. I am responsible for managing all of the technology that runs our uh, product portfolio of talent management, talent management products. Uh, we are the largest unified talent management software provider in, in the world. And I am here to talk to you a little bit today about our experience leveraging pure storage, uh, specifically the cloud block storage solution in our journey into the cloud, uh, addressing some very critical and, and important uh, initiatives uh, that we have been working on over the past five years. So I thought I would begin with maybe just a, a review of our, our journey to the cloud, uh, specifically around how we've, how we've used pure storage in, in various capacities and capabilities. I started with Cornerstone in 2015. It was around that time that, that we launched what I, what I called our site reliability program. Uh, the intent of that program was to sort of reinforce the, the, uh, the core tenets of operations, which are you know, security, resiliency, and reliability. Uh, we took a strategic look at you know, all the ways that we managed our technology, the different investments that we had made. Uh, Cornerstone was on a very you know, large growth trajectory. Uh, we had um, a large client workloads ailing uh, and aging uh, infrastructure uh, in our on-prem environment. And uh, we knew that we needed to make some decisive decisions, uh, including one that, that would uh, basically allow us to, to re-architect our entire data model uh, with a very resilient multi-tiered storage solution, which has a very, very heavy, heavily driven uh, pure storage uh, um, sort of array uh, dependency. So in 2015, we, we brought Pure in, we, we took a look at our entire data model, we re-architected it, we provided capabilities for near real-time data warehousing um, by leveraging high availability uh, implementation of our SQL Server footprint. Uh, we, we leveraged Pure Storage for managing our, our recovery point objectives uh, replication requirements uh, from our primary uh, locations in our regions in the US as well as in the UK. And as a result of that, we were able to improve our system uptime and resiliency uh, exponentially. Uh, we took the uh, company from 99.9% uh, to well over uh, almost to five nines one year, but the, the peak was four nines of, of uptime and availability, which, is, which was rather impressive. During that timeline from 2015 through around 2016, as we were kind of re-architecting the way that, we, that we've done business, we also noticed that there was another uh, need for us to really take a look at how we're enabling the productivity of our organization. 
And it was with that mindset that we decided to uh, uh, take on a, a, an initiative that I called automating our data center. We took all of our manual procedures and leveraged more of a DevOps mindset and created uh, a, a capability of, of, of automating uh, provisioning of various assets in a, in a much more streamlined uh, process that, that allowed us to both address the orchestration elements, the configuration management elements, as well as the compliance uh, requirements that we have to ensure that whatever we're provisioning in our environment uh, is secure and, 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 and resilient. During that time, we also had the mindset and we knew that this work that we were doing for, for, from an automation perspective would benefit us because our, our thought process had always been that we need to look at you know, where, where we're going into the cloud because the cloud is something that you, you quite simply can't ignore. And especially if you're, a, you're in a, a tech space like we are, we, we definitely want to make sure that we're leveraging the right technologies and vendors um, that are available. And so in 2017, uh, we embarked on a project that, that I affectionately labeled Project Nimbus, which was an investigation into cloud capabilities and how best to leverage those capabilities. And during that time also, we were dealing with some, some geopolitical concerns around you know, the, the announced Brexit that happened in the preceding year. And we knew that we needed to make some action there uh, and, and establish a, 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 a footprint that would allow our clients to experience the, the same protections in terms of data sovereignty that they enjoyed uh, prior to the Brexit announcement. So, so in, that, in that time frame from 2017 to about 2018, we built and deployed two new regions in the EU and, and, and allowed our clients to, to realize that, that uh, capability, which, which immediately addressed their, their concerns uh, as a result of, of, of those announcements. Now, as we're, as we're working through that, uh, we still have this sort of idea that, you know, we needed to adopt a more uh, cloud-centric mindset, and our CTO uh, really challenged us. He, he, he told us that, the, you know, the, the mantra going forward had to, had to be around creating, you know, a microservices-oriented uh, product features that, that allowed our developers to, to build products quickly and effectively, leveraging, you know, um, technologies like, you know, cloud providers that, that are on our, our platform today. And, and within the, between 2018 and around 2019 is when we, we really started to, to look at, you know, what product features could we put into the cloud uh, with a cloud-centric mindset. And that's when, when out emerged from that sort of architecture, this, this hybrid cloud um, uh, solution, which allows us to, to deploy product features into the cloud, completely integrated, uh, leveraging uh, Amazon's Direct Connect capabilities with our on-prem data centers. Uh, we were able to pass various compliance attestations uh, from SOC compliance to, to FedRAMP, uh, all, all the while ensuring that our client data was protected and, and, uh, and that the, the integrity of that data was, was, uh, could be attested to. From 2019, last year, we had an opportunity where uh, when you look at a hardware sort of refresh life cycle, Every company has sort of a different one, whether it's two years or three years. And, and, and traditionally, you know, Cornerstone, when we look at our hardware stacks, you know, we, you know we're constantly reinvesting in technology, bringing the, the, the latest and greatest in and, and then aging out uh, legacy, um, you know, technology. And, and we looked at our, a couple of our data centers that we use for, for disaster recovery capabilities, and, and we, we had a choice. We could either invest again to retrofit those data centers as we normally do on a, on a yearly or bi-yearly basis, or we could be strategic in our, in our approach. And this is where I think the, the work that we did from 2017 all the way to 20, 2020, all that preparatory work really allowed us to, to, uh, to sort of uh, realize the benefit of the cloud. All of that work that, that went into, you know, um, uh, developing a sort of a dev stack ops mindset, looking at how we could take our software stack and trim the areas that needed to be trimmed, maybe reduce different product features that didn't need to be there, or make decisions in a different way to make what we're doing on prem uh, capable of fitting within the cloud. And as a result of that, we, we came to the conclusion that it was cost effective uh, and beneficial to, to leverage sort of our, our uh, cloud provider, AWS cloud provider for, for disaster recovery in key specific regions and for key specific clientele. We do still have clientele that, that exists on-prem for various reasons and, the, and, and we're working through those also over time, but the majority of, of the clients that, that live on our platform, um, we decided that it, it made more sense to invest in, in you know, um, 
building out a you know cloud centric sort of DR component, uh, which could not have been you know done in, 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 in the, more, the most opportune time, given that you know when we were ready to sort of launch our initiative in March of this year, COVID um, hit, and you know we we've been in lockdown ever since. And what's interesting about this sort of situation is that you know all of that foresight that we had starting years ago in, in neither of those scenarios, you know, you always think about things like force majeure or catastrophic events. You know, pandemics were sort of furthest from our mind and probably should should never be again. But as a result of that sort of work that we were doing, we were able to very easily and nimbly um, establish a, a DR footprint within Amazon. Which allowed us to to uh, replicate uh, something uh, towards 300 terabytes worth of worth of data within a matter of days into the cloud, and to keep that data incremen incrementally sinking over time to realize sort of you know our RTO and, and RPO objectives. So from from 2015 all the way to 2020, it's really been a journey about establishing and, and sort of reinvestments in our architecture to ensure resiliency and stability and security reliability, but also to ensure that our developers and our and our engineering teams it can be more productive by leveraging technology and automation uh, with, with more of a, a cloud-centric mindset. So I'm going to take you into sort of uh, the analysis that we and the challenges that we had to overcome for this for this VR um, um, and business continuity um, sort of initiative and then sort of show you some of the results. As, a, as that that we that we realized. So one of the challenges that we had first and foremost was how do we manage our client security and compliance requirements? And within those compliance requirements, you have really three core tenants: your your cover point objective, which is the amount of data that you're willing to lose. And in our case, you know we commit to our clients that that we guarantee no more no less than uh, I'm sorry no more than uh, one hour's worth of data loss. And then we also guarantee a recovery time objective of about 24 hours, which traditionally we've been able to demonstrate on-prem, but obviously as anyone that's gone through an on-prem exercise knows, there's plenty of prep time and work that goes into that to be able to demonstrate it and make sure it's ready so that when the day comes that you can attest to a third-party auditor that everything works in the way that it should work. Well, where we, the, well, before I go into that, the, uh, the follow-up to that, the third uh, component of this was to ensure that not only could we ensure no less than one hour uh, data loss and as well as you know 24 hour recovery time objective but also that the data would get there secure and intact and I think that is one of the larger challenges as well as how do you ensure that you know the, the sort of solution that you're that you're going to pick is going to be able to address the specific needs of your organization in our case we had somewhere north of 37,000 various databases that, that we needed to ensure data integrity against. And so as we looked at the three or four different components or, or solutions that we could leverage, we immediately looked at the native capabilities that SQL provided and whether we could just implement you know, a database replication via a mirroring or, or, or any number of, of ways. And it quickly became clear to us that to do something at that scale when you're dealing with as many databases as we're dealing does have an adverse effect. While it's feasible to do, there's also the sort of administrative overhead in managing such a complex number of replication jobs across, you know, literally thousands of different databases. And so we, we, we also looked at, you know, some intermediate products that would allow us to sort of read data from our, our secondary um, HA. Uh, replica and actually replicate that data for us, which would then mean an investment in, in a third party application. And then there was the third sort of solution, which was, well, what can we do natively today with the storage providers that we've been working with over the past few years? And this is where peer storage popped out. And we decided to leverage, use them in a, in a POC last year for about three to four months where we deployed the cloud um, block store solution in our primary US, uh, US uh, West based region on the West Coast. And we tested replication, we tested data integrity, and we tested all the various components of, of the product line to ensure that what we were going to use them for would, would, would indeed uh, fit the bill, so to speak. 
And then, and then on top of that, as we're, as we're looking at this sort of solution, the other thing that we're being very mindful of is that the investment that we're making is, is shifting us more from a, a capital expenditure sort of you know, mindset to one that's more operational expense focused which has also its benefits. You know, when we, when we did the comparison and we knew that to build these data centers would require an immediate upfront investment and there's various financial means and ways that we could have accomplished that. We also knew that if we were to take this on an OpEx model, leveraging the cloud, that through a series of, of optimizations and tuning and, and things of that nature, you know, over time we, we could control our spend much more effectively. And in the end, if we, if we didn't need to use a specific component, we have an easier way of, of migrating that data to a different point and, and, and decommissioning whichever region that, that, that we were existing in. So very attractive for us to, to look at that from a cash flow perspective, because we definitely want to make sure that what we're investing in is, is going to meet uh, our various stakeholder requirements. And that's not just including, you know, sort of the investors at Cornerstone, but also sort of meeting our client expectations as well. So, as we looked at, you know, implementing our solution, uh, the first thing, as I said, we did was we, we went through a proof of concept and we deployed, you know, the cloud block store solution. And then we decided to embark on a series of, of, of tests or what I call evolutions, where we were able to demonstrate not only that we could replicate the data to, you know, the, the corresponding region. In our case, we, we were initially in our co-location on the West Coast and the East Coast. And then, you know, in the future, as we look at the capabilities of leveraging this data in multiple regions, uh, it quickly became apparent to us that, you know, we, we, we had a, a lot more or additional opportunities in front of us. Um, but for our particular use case, the, the biggest concern uh, outside of, you know, whether we can meet the recovery point objective and time objective is really the scalable nature of the architecture and how fast we were able to spin up. And that, that's what led us to deploying you know, redundant set of arrays in, in, in one region where we have a predominant portion of our, of our client footprint and another set of arrays in, in our UK region that was, you know, obviously slightly smaller. But we also were able to demonstrate uh, in a highly automated way, and if we go to the next slide, uh, I'll, I'll walk through this, um, how we can actually take the data from the purity array on-prem through our own dedicated uh, direct connectivity to AWS uh, and into uh, you know, an availability zone and attach that data via the, 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 the cloud block store uh, instance uh, to an EC2 instance and actually read that data and understand how best to scale peer uh, and, and the various components, you know, how, how many arrays, how many virtual arrays, what's your underlying EDS sort of uh, topology gonna look like all of that stuff so that we knew that when we, were, we, we, we deployed these solutions into the cloud, that we could actually run production workloads against it. And that was a really important uh, sort of key performance indicator for us was to understand, could we achieve the same uh, read write operations and IO that we have on-prem in the cloud and with the advancements that have been made in AWS over the past few years, the answer was an unequivocal yes, we, we could, and we were able to demonstrate that. So in, this, so in this particular diagram, what you're seeing here is, you know, we've implemented a, a, a cross-connect replica out-of-band network. We've been seeing, you know, upwards of 400 megabit per second, you know, um, uh, throughput uh, when, when, we, when we watch our replication uh, sort of packets across our network. And uh, we were able to uh, automate uh, leveraging APIs, uh, the, the attachment of the replicated data sets to an EC2 instance and actually pull up our, you know, uh, replicated client data and demonstrate no less than one hour's worth of data loss. Uh, and at the end of the day, not only were we able to achieve that, but then because of the, the on-prem data replication and, and uh, sort of uh, deduplication capabilities that come natively with, with Peer, we were able to realize the same sort of benefit within, within AWS. Um, and this is, this is sort of the go forward uh, design that, that uh, we're leveraging. Uh, and the only modifications that we're probably gonna look at making in the future is adding a little bit more resiliency around, you know, your availability groups and or, or zones, you know, your sort of direct connect capabilities, because there's a lot of different things that the cloud provides you capabilities to, to do, but you, but you really need to understand as you're architecting it, where are your single points of failure so that in a situation where we may lose a leg, 
you know, we can still sort of resilient, resiliently recover our, 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 um, our snapshot replication. Now on the next slide, I'm going to kind of just do a, a quick uh, showcase of, 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 of the, uh, the Pier 1 portal. The cornerstone, we started off with around six arrays five, five years ago, and I think our current um, appliance count is, is roughly 22. Of those, about three are, are CV, uh, CVS-based uh, uh, cloud block store solutions. But overall, we're, we're, we're pretty happy. We, we do see some pretty aggressive you know, uh, data reduction uh, capabilities in, in these arrays, and, and uh, the, the, the Pure One sort of uh, view allows, gives us you know, a keen insight to, to be able to monitor and watch how this, how this solution is performing. And as a result of that, you know, uh, we've been able to see, you know, of, of all of this investment, we've been able to see an improvement in, in sort of our, 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 our KPIs around how fast our data is able to replicate to our, to our DR site and how fast through the power of automation. And, and that is a key point here that I do want to leave everyone with is the, the investment is important, it, it, but there's also an investment in automation that will fully enable a company like Cornerstone to, to achieve far better uh, capabilities in a DR scenario. And in our case, as a result of this investment, we took our, our DR um, uh, timeline from about a 24 hour, you know, 12, 14 hour to 24 hour, depending on the, the on-prem uh, results to, I think the last round of, of testing was roughly around five to six hours. And that meant five to six hours to spin up a complete, you know, stack of servers and, and web servers and, and database servers and attach to peer and pull the data in and, and reflect it within an EC2 instance. So that capability is by, by far is, is priceless. And again, this proves to you what the power of the cloud is. So with that, I'm going to give it back to Kunal and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Wes, uh, for that really insightful uh, look into how DR as a use case was very, very effective in your environment and how Cloud Block Store was able to you know, be a huge benefit for your organization. So let me, let me try to wrap it up now. Uh, given that you guys have learned about Cloud Block Store, you've learned about uh, specifically from the D DR use case, um, you know, one, you know, you heard from Cornerstone about like how effective it was in their environment. Now let me try to kind of talk to you a little bit about the consumption model with Cloud Block Store. So there are two ways to procure Cloud Block Store. Uh, one is through the marketplace and the second one is with Pure as a service. The first one, uh, when, you know, if you have, if you're a customer who uh, prefers, you know, procuring products through the marketplace, you can absolutely do that with Cloud Block Store. You can procure that through the marketplace itself. Use any of your existing uh, pre-commits uh, that you have with AWS towards the purchase of uh, Cloud Block Store. The other way that you can procure Cloud Block Store is through Pure as a Service. Uh, a lot of our customers who have a hybrid setup, which almost most of our customers at least initially have that, where they have certain amount of capacity or applications running on-prem and certain amount of capacity and applications running in the cloud. Pure as a Service gives them a lot of flexibility there that they can have any of the capacity and term commitment that they've uh, that they're using with our on-prem appliances, they can use any of that commitment also in the cloud with Cloud Block Store. So if they've made an investment, uh, if you've made an investment with Pure as a Service uh, with, with a flash array, you can use any of that capacity or term commitment that you've made on-prem, you can take that to Cloud Block Store. So just giving our customers uh, like you a lot of flexibility on how you can consume uh, your subscription with, uh, with Pure Storage. And again, very, very, very uh, flexible ways of even procuring it either through Pure as a Service or through the marketplace. So kind of to sum it up, you know, you heard a lot about, you know, the DR use case. So if you look at what that brings uh, as a benefit to your overall hybrid environment is that you can have a flash array running on-prem, you can have a flash array running in a hosted environment, you can have um, cloud block store running on AWS cloud platform really the same software and the power of the software that the same power of the same the purity software now running in many different deployment types be it on prem be it in a hosted environment or an aws cloud platform again without any compromise um, from a capability perspective helping you address many of the use cases be it disaster recovery be it high availability be it migration 
be it test and dev, or be it just using backups to the cloud, using cloud snap. Again, we can bring the, you know, really the power of our software can help address any of those use cases that you might have in your environment. And finally, you know, the automation piece and the control piece, you know, this uh, with our pure one software that allows you to really manage and operate your entire fleet of flash array and flash blades on-prem. Now we've extended that to cloud block store. You can have, you can manage and operate all of your fleet, be it on-prem or be it in the cloud, all through pure one, knowing that you have a consistent API model between on-prem and the cloud. You have all of the automation and all of the plugins that we have available on-prem are also available in the cloud. Just giving you that, again, that peace of mind that doesn't matter where you, deploy or where you develop or deploy your uh, with your applications, you will have the same set of capabilities and the same set of automation that you have from on-prem to the cloud. So really the way we look at cloud block store is really an extension of your data center now into the AWS cloud platform, giving you absolute flexibility of how you want to run your business. So thank you so much for the time today. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you about uh, cloud block store and how it's been able to benefit Cornerstone as a customer. And I'm hoping that this will be a product that will really help you kind of uh, uh, take your business forward as you're looking to embrace the cloud for many of the different use cases we talked about. Thank you so much. And we'll open it up for questions now. I really enjoyed the customer use case there from Wes at Cornerstone on exactly how this is being used at, um, at the company and how it's really helped you know, a real business out there. So great presentation. We do have some questions coming in from the audience. While we do that, I've brought up this poll question that you see on the screen that just says, what additional information would you like about the pure storage and AWS solution? So uh, I would just want to make sure everybody's here. Uh, Henry Canal and Wes, are you with me? Yeah, I am. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. David? All right, excellent. So let's see, we got some questions coming in from the audience. Um, let's see, first question I wanted to ask is uh, from George. George is asking, um, does the customer have some ability to select how, how the storage is tiered uh, within CloudBlock Store? So currently, um, so I can take that. So the, currently the way CloudBlock Store works, it's not, it's not a tiering really kind of a technology or solution. Um, you have all of your data stored on Cloud Block Store on the back end with Cloud Block Store, as Henry was talking about, we use a combination of instant stores and S3 and EBS storage. Um, so we don't tier within that. We, that's where your data is stored for all the application data that you're writing. Um, like we don't, we don't tier that additionally to another tier of storage within AWS. All of that is kind of stored within that back end that we uh, talked about in the presentation. Okay, okay, makes sense. Um, Another question, uh, Ted is asking uh, if you have any suggestions around a cost calculator to determine the best cost model for each particular business. Uh, any direction on that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So we do have a, you know, a TCO calculator that we have uh, that allows you to kind of, uh, based on how, how much data you think you're gonna be uh, provisioning in AWS, you can see a uh, actual cost for cloud block store uh, it breaks down the cost of the pure licensing cost, and it also uh, breaks down the cost for the AWS infrastructure that we use on the back end. So we do have a, you know, um, we call it the TCO calculator, the total cost of ownership for CBS, uh, which we can absolutely share um, as a follow-up. Uh, that, you know, definitely gives you a lot of insights into how much, you, you know, your cost will be with CBS, and even compares that with, uh, you know, how much that would have alternately cost cost you without the storage efficiencies that we are able to deliver. Okay, excellent, yeah. yeah. And I'll, I'll actually add to that as well, since you know, part of usually when customers are deploying uh, cloud block store, they're also deploying some amount of compute to um, you know, mount the volumes or do other processes that go along with that workload that are outside of cloud block store. So uh, AWS also has a uh, cost calculator and a TCO calculator that can be yep. run for any of those components like the uh, the compute or other components that are outside of cloud block store to be able to understand your, you know, what the uh, cost would look like. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, there's a couple of other questions here about uh, cost and licensing. So it sounds like those cost calculators would be great resources for, for those uh, questions as well. 
Um, another question came in. They're asking about compliance. Can you talk a little bit about compliance when it comes to hybrid, the hybrid cloud model? So um, from a compliance standpoint, uh, you know, if you look at the purity software that runs on the flash array, we have, um, we do have common criteria certification. We have PIPS uh, certification. Given that the same software, uh, purity software runs, is what runs on CBS, uh, we have, you know, all of those certifications in place, like, you know, all of the things that, you know, we have on-prem, we have that in the cloud too. Now, given that um, cloud block store as the appliance gets deployed on AWS infrastructure, uh, which has obviously got, a lot, you know, a lot of those compliance and security certifications already, and it's deployed in the customer's account in their VPC, it adheres to everything that AWS already has from an infrastructure perspective. So from a software perspective, you have all of the security and compliance that carries over from our flash array appliance. And then from an infra, AWS infrastructure perspective, we have uh, obviously leveraging anything on the back end. And Henry, probably you can add to, from an infrastructure perspective, uh, what that means from a security compliance perspective when we are running on AWS. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as, as Kanal mentioned, you know, Pure has a lot of those certifications and on AWS, we have, you know, more than 200 uh, security and certification programs we, we work with. I talked about some of them in the, uh, in the presentation uh, today, but um, if, if you want to get uh, kind of more information about it, we have a um, uh, site known as AWS Artifact. Uh, where you can actually go and, and look at some of these uh, different certifications and get, uh, you know, more detailed information on, uh, on you know, some of the certifications like, you know, PCI and FedRAMP and, um, and, and those type of, uh, and those type of certifications. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, almost, almost any kind of uh, certification program you can uh, you think of, um, you know, it's very likely that um, you'll be able to uh, find information about that and how uh, AWS works with that certification program. Okay, excellent. And then here's a question for Wes. Um, they're asking, how did you choose pure storage over other DR uh, solutions in the market? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a good question. When we when we went through our uh, analysis uh, or pr proof of concept, we actually had about three, maybe even four different product lines that we were looking at. Um, and and I, I'm not concerned about sharing that information either. I think we were looking at native SQL capabilities, uh, which would allow us to sort of mirror, um, you know, databases, but given our footprint and how many we have, and we operate in so many different regions, uh, you know, is it's, it's sort of a daunting task. We also looked at products like Actifio and Delphix and some of the other sort of intermediary solutions that allow you to sort of read in line to your databases. And, and that, that was a particular option as well. The, the challenge for us on, on any new technology was sort of the timeline as well as some of our own internal compliance requirements. And given that, you know, Peer was coming out with, a, with this, uh, you know, CBS sort of solution last year uh, was sort of kismet for us. Uh, which made it very easy, and once we were able to test it and see that it worked, uh, and see that from a from a cost perspective, it was actually cost beneficial compared to other solutions. Not just from a total cost of ownership, but from a pure licensing model as well, um, made it very attractive. So a lot of that sort of thought went into it um, in looking at you know various products and and comparable products that we could that we could leverage. But this one definitely uh, definitely worked for us. Excellent, excellent. That's great to hear. Um, and then a question for Henry. Uh, they're asking uh, if I'm not already using AWS, uh, how how easy is it to get started with this solution? Oh, great question. Uh, so it's 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 really easy to get uh, to get going. Uh, you know, for, first thing is to you know need to do is to sign up for an AWS account. Uh, we have something that's called uh, free tier. So actually, if you go to um, aws.amazon.com/free, you can actually sign up with just you know a few um, few clicks to uh, to get a free tier account where you get access to certain services uh, for uh, for free for uh, for 12 months. Um, and you know all the uh, various services uh, that we offer, the majority of services that uh, we offer are, are pay-as-you-go, as I 
mentioned during the uh, presentation. So you can also, aside from the uh, the free services, you can you know easily spin up and uh, and test things uh, on demand and only pay for uh, for what you're testing if it goes beyond that uh, that free tier, as opposed to having to um, you know make any uh, kind of uh, commitments. It just lets you really try things out. And as far as um, you know, Cloud Block Store, uh, as Canal mentioned, it's available on the AWS Marketplace. So once you sign up for an AWS account, you'll be able to have access to the AWS Marketplace and be able to uh, to quickly deploy the solution and test it out. Excellent, excellent. Well, it sounds very easy to get started with. I love that it's in the Cloud Marketplace um, as well. Uh, it looks like we're running out of time here in today's event, so I think we should probably uh, wrap it up. And um, I want to announce the winner of the Amazon $300 gift card. That is going out to Christopher Smith from Nevada. Congratulations. We'll reach out to you to deliver that gift card. And I want to remind everyone out there to uh, check out uh, purestorage.com as well as the AWS Marketplace to learn more about Cloud Block Store. Uh, Kunal, Wes, and Henry, thank you so much for your presentation today. Thank you so much. Thanks for the time, everyone. Thank, thank, thank you. you. And thank you to our audience for joining us. We appreciate your time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.